Take out your assignment. Um, how are you doing? How are you doing? Almost done. We got to get going, people. We're falling behind. Oh, dear. And the rest of your life isn't in front of you. Does that help? Go better now? No. Every major decision you have to make has to be done in the next six, seven dollars. I don't know. I would do. How are we doing? Day two. Tired. It's not cold. <laughs> do you want to? Here's first lesson on democracy. Are you ready? You want a lesson on democracy? Yes. Uh, we'll have a vote. A very fair vote. Who thinks it's? Who thinks? It is far too warm in here. Raise your hand. Okay, I'm, and I, this is a lesson one of Oxy. Raise your hand. It's unanimous. Everybody thinks it's too warm. You've learned your first lesson of democracy. Those who vote do not count. Those who count the vote, they count. Did you feel good now? No. <laughs> By the way, we have an assignment. We'll talk about rides. We are filming this. Oh, this is. Hmm? This is film? Oh, yeah. I got. I film one class, one of my AP classes every day. The chosen class? Uh, usually I do third, I forgot. Third or fourth. I'll do first because I'm still in first period. So I'll third, and then I'm my production team look at it, edit out the mistakes, yeah. have it smooth. Yeah. So uh, same deal. I'll take roll. Raise your hand. Ooh, it's getting kind of warm in here. Yeah. Power of positive thinking. So. Oh, right, here we go, Isabel. Cole, where are you? There you are. I knew you were there. Emma. Here. Yep. All alone. Yep. Clarice. Yep. And you got Clarice or? Claire. Claire. That's what I thought. You put that on your um, assignment. Yeah. I did look at this in, and people did well. I mean, especially with the first one. A few things where you, I could tell were like you were trying to finish up really quick on the last question. So for the most part, people did well on it. Um, I always like to wait a little bit and record and see if people switch classes, but I plan on giving it to you to give it back tomorrow. Dominic? Here. Okay, Angelina? Here. Henry? Here. Jaden? Here. Matthew? Here. Alexis? Here. Okay, Tadley? Here. Ethan? Lindsay? Here. Catherine? Here. Uh, Elizabeth? Olivia? Got everyone? Good? Everyone happy? Any questions on the assignment? Okay, if you have them, if you need a stapler to staple the two pieces together, there's one stapler here, anybody else need one? Are we good? And then if not, rip it off very carefully. Please print your name on top and the period. Now, when I grade these, I'm not going to go through like every one and say, oh, you didn't get everything up. I'm going to look at it. I'm rewarding you for reading this, especially during the summer. So I'm going to give you points for this. As long as I can tell you to took it seriously, try to get uh, information down from the book. And the big thing is I'm hoping down the road related to something else, and that's something we'll do, we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But I want to give everybody points for this. You ought to do it in the summer. I know a lot of classes have summer assignments, but uh, it's still a pain. Can you want it? Your name? Find yours. Very good, very good, very good. Stay. 
They're going to have them up. Well done. All right. So I'll get these back in as quick as possible. Normally, we won't have this kind of notes for books, books. The textbook is a supplement to what we do in class. Sometimes it will be more of that. Stay. And we'll go from there next. Oh, is that the... For me? Okay, so uh, before we get to that, I'll do a few notes here in a sec. Let me. So I'm, I'm going to have something about the fornication laws. No, just so you don't panic. This is a bunch of stuff all the way through the Constitution, the ratification laws. So there's a uh, worksheet for a video we're going to watch in class. There's a couple reading things, all kinds of stuff in here. You're only going to read the first three paragraphs for, for fun. But I, just, I hand them all together so you have it at one thing. I still have my... Oh, you have the 3 old punch. Oh, yeah. You want it later to do 3 old punch? I forgot to punch these. There's a map at the end. You know, I just pack them all in. And we'll read something called the fornication one. And originally I was going to do it on Thursday, and I just decided that was too soon. So either Friday or Tuesday, and I'll let you know. We're going to have a little quiz, and I call it the short ID quiz. It's from a thing that uh, on the college, Dr. Short, called them short IDs, and that's why I just still call them short IDs. And it's a way we do writing in class. You're going to have to write a lot of it. And those of you who took AP class before, especially if you took AP Euro before, you, know, you write a lot. And there'll be a, a full essay, a couple full essays on the AP exam. We'll do some of those. But I also like to chunk it up and work on it. And that's what I like about short ID so much. It's a great way to answer questions. It's a great skill to have. I mean, I'm not kidding. It's a great skill to have. I get uh, students come back. Uh, and they go to college, and they will say, you know, those things work. And by the way, learning how to write like that has helped so much in college. So what is a short ID? Short ID, I'll give you a list of terms. And you'll pick some. So this term like you know, Bacon's Rebellion, or this first great awakening. I'm just throwing things out. Dred Scott decision, the Tet Offensive. Yes, these are all things we'll eventually get to someday. Bacon's Rebellion is a really big one. And the reading I gave you is about Bacon's Rebellion. So I'll explain that in just a second. But I'll give you a term to, to identify. And there are three parts to a short ID. And I'll remind you again, but you need all three to get full credit. And so, if we're doing Bacon's Rebellion, it's three to four sentences. No topic sentence. Don't write in your own, in this one, don't write in your own. This is you know, Bacon's Rebellion or something. Now, in that say you do that. So for a short ID, just jump right in. And those first one or two sentences, you have to explain what Bacon's Rebellion was. So a brief summary, what it was, when, where. Do those basic facts. 1776, a rebellion of the underclass against the late ruling class. I'm just throwing things out here for right now. Explain what it is, as concise as possible. It is very easy to get wordy and start writing down stuff, especially if you're thinking, well, I want to show I know stuff. I'm going to write down everything I know. Yeah, that's fine. I've done that. I've got to write down a bunch of stuff thinking, you know, I'll backload my garbage. But you don't have time for that. 
And the time to essay, especially, you think about, okay, I'm not going to teach you how to do a test, but the AP exam is time. You have other tests or time. You have class period time. You're always going to have a time limit. We want to be concise and get down what's important. What it is, where, when, the basic fact. And if you don't know the exact date, don't run, don't make up a date. The biggest rebellion happened in 2014. No. If you don't know 1676, write down 1670. Write down 17th century. You know what I mean by that? By the way, anyone know what I mean by the 17th century and 1600s? There's no zero. Let's start that way. Okay, good. No zero. zero. All right, so the next sentence. Give me an example of it. Give me some people who are in it. Give me some specific things about it. An example, something specific. What happened? Something very specific about it. Does that make sense? An example. That's really important. And that's part of it. Then the last sentence is key. This is the important part. This is the one that will help you on essays, help you learn something. It's an important way to think. The last part, the third step, well, third or fourth sentence, I'll give you it, but the third part. What did it lead to? AKA, why is it important? Why is it important? Bacon's Rebellion, this class revolt, it was put down by a combination of militia and winter, you know, stuff like that. It's a big deal. Maybe just write down that, it, it becomes just a little factual. Just a little thing, okay, there's facts all over, you pick one, okay, it's a fact, you can throw it away. Now, why is it important? All of history, everything, it's especially the way I teach it, and the way it's the easiest to learn. One thing, one step, led to another, led to another, led to another. And that's the way you have to think. Why it's important, that will help link it to other things and make it easier to remember. Why was Bacon's Rebellion, rebellion important? It literally changed the world. Did not sound about saying that. Yeah, it changed the world and people were different. You know why it was important? It led to what's called the slave codes. And slave codes led to directly to what we call racism. That's what we call a big deal. That's a big deal. Racism did not exist before slavery in the new world. At least racism is we know. In fact, the term race did not even exist. But it made no sense to someone. It's a big deal. So I gave you one, I gave you a really big one, obviously. But you might say, you know, the Dred Scott decision. Well, heck, that led to almost uh, infuriated the, the North, the Republican Party grew in power and led to the election of Abraham Lincoln, which led to the South to see starting the Civil War. That's an example. So I'm not looking for, and it led to peace and happiness and everyone got together and helped. No, it's got to be specific things. So, yeah, that's important for a test and you know, important to destroy IDs. But if you think that way, it becomes easier to remember. If you just get a bunch of stuff and it becomes individual little factoid, you know, little like, oh, pull out this fact. Oh, okay. Maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. But if you get things, get material, you know, Bacon's Rebellion, or the slave cuts, or the development of racism, led to the sectional divide led to the Civil War, led to Reconstruction. We can go on and on and on. If you can pick out one thing next to another, then it becomes easier to remember. It makes sense. It becomes more interesting. And then down the road, one of the reasons um, this class, um, students come to this all the time, it gets easier as the time goes by. When you start having things to link material to, it's not just individual factors. He agrees. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta. Since me this class, torture does not begin for a while. <laughs> Normally they hear me yelling. Okay, so. You pain. Um, now, if you have something to link it to, it becomes easier to remember. So we build on the other material. And that's why I always teach it. This led to this. And I always say this led to this. And I'll say, um, you can see the remnants of it today. I'll do that all the time. If you can build that skill, 
which a lot of people you know, just don't do. Now, smart, of course they're smart. People can do all kinds of stuff. But if you build that, everything just becomes easy. It just becomes easy. It's just fun. And I like in memory, and this is a, a great thing. You know, most people just don't have a photographic memory. By the way, do you know anybody with a photographic memory? Or any of you with a photographic memory? Oh, me. <laughs> You know, and I, I have a friend, and he can still remember, I mean, like verbatim conversations we had in high school. And that was the 1920s for me, when I was in high school. So, like a long time ago. But no, he remember verbatim. He was like, you freak. But, you know, most people don't have that. But if you have something you can link it to, a memory, and I liken it to a song. Here's a song you like. And if you ask you, what are the words of the song? You couldn't do it, but then once you hear it, what can you do? You're going to end up singing along. That's what it's like. That's what it is. I don't have that kind of memory. I have a pretty good memory, but not that. I have a better memory than you. I'm not right. I just do. And my parents have better memory than me. So on and so on. Technology um, kills them. Kills them. So that's, I didn't have as much technology as you do, so I have a better memory. My parents didn't have as much as they have a better memory. And so, but, those aren't that special. No. And so, you hear that, it kind of things put together, and that's the way it works. That's why I should add to you. If you think, well, I don't need to know that because I'll look it up, you're already stuck. You're better. The more stuff you have to look up, the less you can do. Because what are you doing? You're looking stuff up. I'm not saying you're going to know everything, but if you know something, you already have a pretty good background, you hear something, you can immediately start thinking about it. You can link it, okay, I get this. If you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, and go look it up, oh, maybe you'll remember it someday, but the more you have to do that, the harder it is to remember stuff. There's no thinking unless you know stuff. So you have to know stuff. There'll be some memorization. By the way, who's ever done the thing where you've memorized a list of things for a quiz? You done that? Even if you got 100%, how quickly you should forget most of it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Except for you, of course. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, I know I have this linkage. You know, I have all this stuff. You know, it's a trick. I mean, you tell me a year, and I can tell you who the president is. Any year. 1842? John Tyler. But the thing is, you just, I can just do it. It doesn't make it smart. By the way, someone, I said that uh, third period, someone goes, uh, 1740. <laughs> <laughs> that says more about you than me. Okay, so. It doesn't get smart, it's just that's memory. But boy, doesn't it give you advantage? Because if, if I know stuff, you can tell something, I can act like I really know something. I'm not going to Or in other words, yes. But uh, it really helps. So try your best to learn the link, link it in house. So I'll give you the list. I'm going to tell you what the four things are before the test. Two paragraphs, how long would that take? Ten minutes? We're going to write it by hand. We do everything by hand. Write it by hand. I would prefer some things type two because it is easier to read, but the AP exam is all handy. So we just got to get used to it. Second semester, everything's going to be in pen. Because the AP exam has to be in pen, so we got to get used to writing. Mm -hmm. And I make mistakes, so I sympathize, but we just got to get used to it. It's pain, but it's life. It's easier to see, and actually, uh, it's easy, you don't have to press down as hard. The problem is if you, if you make mistakes, it can be a little nerve wracking. But you're right. So, so we just have to get used to it. But it's, it, it's just the way life is. It's, it's the hooky up the jumper. All right, so I'll give you the list. Sound good? And so I'll, we'll do that as a test. I'm going to give you really good hints on the first few tasks for short IDs and essays. As year goes by, those hints will go away. Because my expectation is you'll be getting better at it. All right, so let's look at the assignment. So the assignment is, when you read this, you have to underline examples of the, in the first three paragraphs, this video on Friday, underline examples of how this law, these, this is law. These first paragraphs, law. 
Write down examples of how this would divide the class. I have that on top. I wrote down, you know, the Virginia coordination laws. So we'll do that on Friday. Before we get to that, let me ask you, well, you, you did this on your own. But this was done by the House of Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was the first legislative body in the English colonies. Now, a Burgess was a big landlord. So all the big landholders got together because Britain was so far away and the company was so far away and they made their own laws. And who did they make the laws for? Huh? Say it again. It's race laws. Well, these are going to be race and class. Yeah. But they're for Virginia and basically to help what people? Themselves. So they're, you know, yeah, the Burgesses, the big landlords. What's fornication? What's fornicate? Huh? Sex. Not quite. Okay. Sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of marriage. And you notice they have on top they have the filthy sin of fornication. <laughs> so it's implied this is a crime. Do they want to stop fornication? <laughs> Who's fornicating? The Burgesses. Do they want to quit? No. And they also want to keep their land. So think about that when you read that. When you read these. The laws are remarkable. But one thing that's very important, okay, indentured servants. Indentured servants are people, you know, they basically give up their freedom for seven years, their passage over, they might get a little piece of land, but they're slaves for seven years, which shows how bad things were in England. Other slaves who are either American Indians who are captured or African slaves, they were much like indentured servants. They just didn't have a contract in seven years, but that's basically the way they were treated. So if they're called slaves, they were treated no differently than the servants. They just didn't have a contract saying you're going to be free in seven years. So slavery, as you might think of it, didn't exist yet. It's coming. It might be coming out of these. So on that happy note, this is what we do on Friday. We'll talk about it on Friday. <coughs> Sound good? Next, let's go take your notes out. So we didn't know it today. I will do notes. I will talk about things. I City. Who's been to Mile City? You haven't, yeah, they probably you couldn't have made it. It's a tough town. Yeah. Where were you in Mile City? <laughs> Where's Mile City? Hundred fifty miles. That's where I grew up. Hundred fifty miles. Ten thousand feet. It's, it's actually rough. It's crazy. When I was a kid, there was gunfights in the street. <laughs> 1880s. Okay, so I do notes in here. I got a lot of PowerPoint. I like PowerPoint just because you show pictures. Sometimes I'll write things on the board. But the big thing I do is what I uh, I like showing pictures. I'll give the main points, but you have to fill that in. And it's a really valuable skill. To be able to listen to something and then interpret it in your own words. Don't write down what I say, interpret it. And as quickly as possible in your own shorthand. If you try to write down everything or just copy, you will not remember. And I try to synthesize things and get things to the key elements and try to show you how things tie together. Because you know the textbook is great giving um, information, it doesn't do a very good job, job at that. Zen is great at telling stories, does not do a very good job at that. Uh, except for very broad scales. So I really try to emphasize that. By the way, whenever you see European pictures from the 17th century of American Indians, they're always incredibly muscular, fit, tall. In Columbus called them almost beautiful people. The jealousy is just unreal. Then, of course, he followed it with they make great slaves. But why were they so fit and vigorous? It would also be their doom. <coughs> Yeah. 
Say it again. No, no, the Europeans are like that. Oh. You want to you want to talk about people who know how to fight? It was Europeans. Yeah. Europeans had to do a lot of that too. Was it because there's jobs and they want them to work for space because like that big bump so you can like my lawn <laughs> not quite. No. You know, it's not a bad way to think. I mean, a good think thought process. There are probably, probably, probably between 150 and 150 million people who live in the Americas when Columbus arrived. So that means over 100 million live in what is now the United States. When I was in school, I was told one to five million. Because no one can wrap their mind around the fact that by 1890, there were 280,000 American Indians. They couldn't wrap their mind around that kind of slaughter and death. Just can't wrap their mind around it. What killed them all? So they didn't have the diseases, so they're healthy. That's the big thing. Very simple. Why did they have the diseases that the European, or why did they die of the diseases? What? Let me start over again. <laughs> why did they die of the diseases that the Europeans brought when the Europeans were not dying in the same way? Yes. Why weren't they immune? They didn't what? Why did they have the diseases? They didn't have what? So what about the environment? Animals. 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 Think about all the domesticated animals, and that's where virtually all the disease comes from. Virtually all the domesticated animals. Okay, chicken all over. Uh, air. Asia and Africa, but even though there's cattle in Africa, most of the cows now worldwide, cattle would be domesticated here, the chickens domesticated here, pigs here and here, horses here, virtually all diseases come from there. You're being to live with those animals. They get those diseases, they're, they're dying from those diseases, they're getting the immunities. What domesticated animals existed in the New World? Apacas and llamas, which aren't domesticated that much because they're kind of mean. It's like you, you can't domesticate a zebra, same thing, they're mean. Can't domesticate a bison, they're mean. They have what? Which are good eats. Skin, parboiled, little seasoning from the gallbladder. And that's actually. That was a recipe. It's <laughs> just showing you recipe. Hey, that's how I got to college. <laughs> guinea pigs? Who's that guinea pig? Not to have one, have it to eat. You had it. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Why this time? No, I was someplace where that was, he ate that, and I tried it because, you know, one of those things called children. And it tasted just like guinea <laughs> Uh, Muscovy ducks, which are big black ducks. Um, that's about it. There were horses. Horses are actually an uh, American animal. And they went to Asia over the same land bridge that humans came over, anywhere from 25,000 to 12,000 uh, BC. E. Uh, the problem is when the humans all came to the Americas, they really liked the taste of horse and ate them all. And so horses kind of made their return when the Spanish came back. And so they didn't have those diseases. And that's what they did. And so they have very broad civilizations. If you look at here, these are all areas out here that the American Indians had farmed. They, um, they had changed the land. They farmed vast agricultural communities all over here. I mean, just vast communities. And they planted everything together. Europeans got in the mode, and this actually goes back to Rome and Greece and Sumeria even. You can plant all one crop so you can um, pick it all. The problem is that really uses up the soil pretty fast. They planted everything together. Harder to pick, better for the soil. So you would have every, everything from potatoes to maize to squash all together in one big field. Tomatoes, you name it. And more people here because there's rain. Areas with less rain. They're nomadic, and by definition, nomadic tribes are smaller because more, you need fewer people to feed. Agricultural communities, they get bigger, not only because it's surplus of food, because and also children become good little orphans. And people still have that attitude about children, they're mine. 
So with that, they become workers. By the way, you see the same opposite same thing happening when people start moving to cities. Families get smaller because you don't need little workers, and but children still eat. Did you know that? You eat. And you gotta pay for them. And it's different than a farm. So families will get smaller again when they become more urban. Well, these are the population that lived here, and they'd be devastated. And I should add, up here in New or okay, Irish will say that uh, Saint um, Saint Patrick came in 800 A.D. to America. Probably not, but hey, what the hell? I like Ireland. But who came here first? Probably about uh, 1200. Yeah. Like me, Eric. Yeah. Or as we like to say, English, Eric, the Red, you know, but yeah. So they get Iceland, the Norse, Iceland, Greenland, and Labrador. Why do they call it Greenland? It's, it's green. With the mini ice age hit in the 14th century, uh, they disappeared. We have no idea what happened. So. Died, probably joined the Inuits, but we don't know. They try to explore Labrador. And the thing is, yeah, okay, they arrived. Of course, it's silly to say to discover when there's 100 million or 200 million people living there. But that didn't change the world. When Columbus arrived, the world changed. And that's what we got to say with the fact that literally everything changed. The entire world's economy changed. The entire monetary system of almost every place in the world changed. Heck, a, a dynasty in China fell because of this. Everything changed. The world became globalized with Columbus. All of a sudden, you know, within 20 years of Columbus, or 30 years of Columbus, you have people trading from Mexico to China directly. And it's just a whole new world. Everything changed. So that's why we got to go here. It wasn't because Columbus was smart or dumb or whatever. It's all these things happen in Europe, and that's why, <laughs> by the way, it's 1400 Europe. Let's get to reasons for exploration. Let's get to the reasons. Here is this wonderful map. And I like this map. By the way, once again, this is a Mercator projection. So they take the globe and then they stretch it out on a sheet of paper. And when it does that, areas around the poles stretch out. So Greenland is not bigger than Africa. Greenland is significantly smaller than Africa is actually much bigger. It kind of diminishes the size of Africa. Well. This mountain valley triggered everything. When the glaciers came in, oh, I lost the mouth. There we go. I know better, but I'm not in the swing of things. So Portugal was the first one to really start exploring. Portugal began bouncing around Africa. Spanish came later, and they decided to go this way because Portugal already had a head start, and they were able to convince. Uh, the king and queen of Spain that uh, is faster that way. Why did Portugal begin going around this way? What did they want that was starting to become in great demand in the two or three hundred years before? Yeah, a little bit silk. Silk was really valuable in jade, but there's something else they wanted even more. Say it again. Well, they would love precious metals, but even more as a trading commodity. Yeah, spices. spices. Spice, if you, if you said I didn't hear it, I'm sorry. But spices were worth their weight in gold, more valuable than gold, because you grow them again. And spices are just, wow, this has changed everything. Just pepper, wow, pepper. So they wanted pepper. Where did pepper come from? Here. And so, trade. Trade is number one. Where's my mouse? Trade. Well, let's go back to this. Here. How did it get to the uh, to Europe? Red Sea, caravan routes across the Suez, then the Mediterranean. But in between India and here were a bunch of different people. Most importantly, 1453, this group here called the Ottoman Empire. They conquered Constantinople, which today is Istanbul. They dominated that trade. And what? So they would trade here and they traded to the rest of Europe. 
What does the middleman do to the price? They raise the price. Oh, sure, the Ottoman Turks would gladly trade with everybody, but they raise the price. And they really like to trade with Genoa and Venice. And what would they do? Jack the price. So what did Portugal want? Avoid the middleman. Makes sense, right? So it's more than just spice. Spice trade the Ottoman Empire, Venice and Genoa. Avoid them. Get around them. And therefore, they can jack the price. And so they started going around Africa. They had the jump head start. Now, that's one thing. Trade. Partially triggered by the Crusades, which were still actually going on. Portugal kind of considered themselves on the Crusades throughout the entire 1500s. Then it would turn into a crusade against the Ottomans. It's complex. Two, technological developments. Technology. And the thing about technology, it's more than just a new invention. It's more than just a new way of doing things. It's a way of thought. And the way to do that is talk about maps. More importantly, the idea of perspective. We, we our mind is automatically conditioned to think of perspective. So when we look at this picture from about 1000 AD, and this is supposed to be Mary, and that is Jesus. By the way, Middle Evil paintings, Jesus, uh, they draw, drew a lot of, of Jesus' uh, um, baby, and the creepy faces on them is just unbelievable. They drew them as adults, and they're just creepy. But they have a lot of these. Which is interesting. Christmas was not an important holiday at all for Christians. At all. They didn't care. Easter was. But a lot of these pictures. If we looked at this to our view of what perspective would be, it appeared that Mary was a giant. <laughs> right? Their idea of perspective was its importance to our belief system, a.k.a. religion. Mary was important, so she's the biggest. Even as a baby, Jesus is bigger than all the adults, right? With the creepy face. <laughs> now, Mary was not a giant. These are supposed to be various, the apostles, saints, and you know, it's lesser saints on top, right? They're smaller. Size is by your importance. So mere humans are always drawn as very tiny. Someone in 1200 Europe, that made perfect sense. That's the way they view the world. In a different way to view it. Technological development is a total radical shift that we all have. I mean, I've experienced that. In my lifetime, we've, um, we've had the digital revolution. We became digital. It wasn't like that. It was just starting when I was your age. And so, that's a radical new way to think of it. So I did shift in the job. You didn't have to. You were just born into it. And I'm certain there will be something else down the road. Who knows what it will be? Where you have to make the shift. It might already be happening, not even realize it quite yet. But a lot of times this will be called the Renaissance. The Renaissance is not a set time. If you took AP Euro, this is where you started the Renaissance. Who took AP Euro? You? Yeah. Third period is like almost half all the class. So. But it's. They call the rebirth, but rally that was just kind of named afterwards. But this is a shift in thought. It took about 300 years. Things were a little bit slow for them. So let me give you an example of things. Oh, I should show you a couple of medieval art. Here's another creepy baby already with a receding hairline. And then this one, I'm still trying to figure it out, but it appears to be a rabbit beheading a guy, which I got to say, uh, I don't want to meet this rabbit, or especially the rabbit carrying the dog, finding a rabbit on a snail with a human head. Okay, let me rephrase that. I would love to see that. I would pay any amount of money to watch that. Still trying to figure that one out. Okay, so look by the 16th century. That is a school of Athens by the great artist Raphael, one of my favorite artists. It's in the Vatican Museum. And you see everyone's drawn to perspective. The buildings are drawn to perspective. Your eyes are immediately drawn to the center where it's supposed to be uh, Aristotle and uh, Socrates. I'm sorry, yeah, Aristotle and Socrates. I mean, it's just this brilliant work of art. Okay, 
This flat picture doesn't do it justice. It's in the Vatican Museum in Rome, and it would, it's about twice the size of this wall. We should go. You want to go? Yeah. Okay, get a yellow school bus, high jacket, and we'll take off cross country. <laughs> we'll be in Italy in no time at all. My nephew lives in near Rome, so we discussed. He's seven, but wow. <laughs> he won't mind, though. He's very happy to see us. So that's map with that same. Could you use that map? <laughs> what the heck is this? By the way, what's the center of the universe? This map. <laughs> What makes me mad too is that you spent to put my own pictures up. Now I, I'm stuck with a random valley picture. Not that it's not pretty, but I want my own picture of a random valley. Jerusalem. This is a map done by Christian. Does that make sense? So that means all maps orient to Jerusalem. Have you ever heard somebody, they would say somebody from Asia called um, somebody from the Orient? That's where that comes from. Because it orients to the east, that's where Jerusalem was. I know there's a lot of distance between Jerusalem and, let's say, Japan, but to someone in Britain in 1300, it's all about the same. Look how the maps changed by 1474. That's the map Columbus had of the Atlantic. I mean, that's I know. Don't bother yourself now. It's, kind of, we, it's still not quite to our point of view, but that's Spain. He didn't know how big Japan was where he went. And what are these lines? It's perspective. That's what Columbus had. Columbus had that map. Huh? Yeah, that's how he drew it. He was trying and unsuccessfully to take us a globe and put it flat. Oh, okay. And it didn't work very well. I saw it as like. And you think about latitude and longitude, if you know that, yeah. even if you don't know where exactly you are on the map, if you know latitude and longitude, you know where you are on the globe. It's a big deal. And so this shows you the problem, though. That's Toscanelli's map across, um, transcribed across the U.S. or across the real Atlantic. He thought it was about 60% the size of the actual Earth. So this is where he thought Japan was, where Mexico was. So that's how come Columbus was able to sell this trip, because he said it was shorter than going around Africa. Turned out, not quite. But that's what he had. And so you look at it that way, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? And once again, they're, they were incredibly smart, and, and they thought the world was round. Every, not thought, they all knew the world was round. So that, Toscanelli. So look by the end of the 16th century, look at this map. That helps. Where's the mouse? There we go. That's a Portuguese map. Look how good that map is. Isn't that just amazing? And this is all done using a compass and geometry, a compass and a straight edge to measure miles, and they're on the shore. Okay, they had no idea what was in here, but that's incredible. Yeah. And look at India, Madagascar. Hmm? What part? The Red Sea. Oh, yeah. Isn't that Persian Gulf, India? I mean, this is well done. See, somebody landed here, so they winged it. That turned out to be Australia, but they had no idea, idea, well, no idea how big it was, so they just kind of drew it. No, this is not an hour. They just winged it. Yeah. Huh? Just at the end of the 1500s. Really impressive, isn't it? So once you have this, now you can follow your app. Maps become useful. Map making became a great skill, as you can imagine. So, what other navigate or what other technological changes? Okay, we know what compass is. You know which way is north and using that. Do we try to ever orient by a compass and find things? It's kind of cool, but it can be really difficult. And one problem was right here, there's a disturbance, some kind of magnetic field problem with magnetic north, and the compass is called haywire. 
the Columbus kind of green dot right here. That's where the whole myth of the, you ever, ever heard of the Bermuda Triangle? Which is really, it's not, a, there's no more ships sunk here that you can sell. But because of that, that's where the whole thing comes from. It's a pretty good story, doesn't it? Uh, Astrolab, that's where you can find the height of the North Star. And once you find that, you can find that. The problem with the Astrolab is the North Star isn't in the Southern Hemisphere. Then you get scared. It's not safe to use the sun. And they would come up with charts. And so Columbus had charts from the Canary, or he had it from the Cape Verde Islands all the way up to almost where uh, the northern part of Norway. He had where the sun was, or, or where the North Star was, every day. Every day, and if you know that, you can find your latitude. So Columbus went down to the latitude of, of India and just kept on. Longitude, you need a really good clock. They didn't have a good clock to the end of the 18th century. So longitude just made up, or they went, but they could find out. And then ran into Watling Island. New kinds of ships, Caracs and Caribos. That's a Carac right here, a modern ship. Before they had galleys, what propelled galleys? Guys rolling. Volunteers. They're not bad. Okay, they're really bad for the people rolling, but you need room for the rollers. So you, you don't have room for cargo. If it's a ship, a more modern ship with sails, you have room for cargo or cannon. And that would be revolutionary. So you can carry more food, more cargo, you make trips worthwhile. And then they can get bigger. And one more thing I'll add, you ever heard of a Latin sail? Does anyone ever sail? They sail and you can sail and go into the wind, but you have to tack. It's a Latin sail, is that? A triangular sail. And you can use that to guide into the wind. Before it was just a big square sail. And so you went what direction? Yeah. So for half the year in the Mediterranean, the wind blows from east to west. So you only go west. <laughs> Or we have rollers. This changed everything. You can whiz along into the wind, one or two miles an hour, but still you're whizzing along. All right. On that happy note, when the bell ring? Is the bell ring at noon? Oh, the bell rings at noon. Um. How we? I was in the bank. I want to finish this up. Um. Oh, I should have one more thing. They have really shallow drafts because of the weight. And so I, I'm telling you one more thing. So can we see a phone out? Oh, it's noon. So the shallow draft, what's the problem with these ships? Yeah, one good gust of wind. It's... All right. So any questions on... Communication laws, any questions on that? All righty, then. You want three old punch? This is a three old punch. I get this. Which part? The three paragraphs by Friday. So you have to have it done by Friday. Okay. So that number one. Yeah, just number one. So it's just the first three paragraphs. And we'll do the other part. Uh, we'll read that. There's a couple other things. Worksheet, map, more reading, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So unlike examples about it, we use this law as a wedge between the classes or races. Okay. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, one of these days I'll tell you about money. I told first period we need to go and get this far. Because somebody asked a very valuable about a very valuable question. Why is gold valuable? So I, I told them how gold became valuable. And I will tell you that just someday. Down the road, next time I do that, I'll, I'll remember. Quick recording.